I'm very excited to talk to you because I your book talks a little bit about your firsthand experience being under state surveillance for much of your adulthood. Um, but I also Wikipedia would you and, and saw some of your longtime activism and the price that you paid for it. So I, I guess we can start there. Um, talk a little bit about your experience of being under state surveillance, both in prison and un under electronic surveillance outside of, of prison. Okay, well, I mean, as I talk about in the book, I was actually, I was a fugitive for 27 years on federal uh, possession of explosive charges from the, from the mid-1970s. And I spent most of that time in Southern Africa. I spent a lot of that time doing work with social justice movements, with the liberation movements in South Africa and Zimbabwe fighting against apartheid and colonialism. Uh, in 2002, I was extradited back to the U.S. I spent six and a half years in, in, in prison in federal and state institutions in California. And when I came out in 2002, uh, sorry, in 2009, I was placed on an electronic monitor. When I got, the day after I got home, they put this thing on my ankle and they told me I would only be allowed out of the house from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Monday through Friday. And that really kind of changed my idea of what freedom was going to look like after all those years of thinking about it. And I began to ask some questions about this device. Who made the rules for it? Who was making money off of it? And probably most importantly for today, where was this device going in terms of its capacity to surveil? At that time, it was, it was tracking location, but it didn't do some, have a lot of the bells and whistles that are on devices now. And it wasn't really connected to a broader surveillance state that it is now, which is kind of what I talk about in the in the book, which I refer to as e-carceration. And and it's not just a surveillance state, and we can get into that. It's it's very global, uh, which is part of what's terrifying about a lot of this technology. Um, but I guess uh, I, I I also um, hope you could expand on how you're your uh, activist work was very much a part of the liberation politics of the 70s and during that period. I mean, how did your uh, your activism and your experience with that maybe give you a different perspective on uh, the, the e-carceration, electronic monitoring that you later dealt with in your life? Okay, so my, my activism in the in the seventies in the U.S. was, I mean, I mean, I was involved in anti-war movement, but I became involved in revolutionary violence, as we called it. Um, I mean, I have a lot of, I have a lot of of uh, reflections on that particular choice, but I think I learned a very different politics when I went to Southern Africa and I became part of mass movements, which involve ordinary workers, ordinary community members who, despite not having extensive formal education, who despite not being, who despite having English as their fourth or fifth language, were still able to conduct incredible political debates and political campaigns and begin to develop a model of participatory democracy, which involved ordinary people making decisions and building organizations and being able to pull 3 million people out on any given day on a general strike. So that, that kind of activity really changed my idea about what politics should look like. And that's why when I, when I came back to the US, uh, I looked around inside these prisons and I saw, I, I just saw the, this endless sea of bodies coming through the gate, disproportionately black, disproportionately brown, overwhelmingly poor. And I had to try to figure out what was going on here because I hadn't really followed this phenomenon of mass incarceration. So I, when I came out, I had taken the decision that I wasn't going to be able to go back to South Africa because I was on parole. So I was going to do work in this community in the U.S. around the issues of mass incarceration and try to apply some of the lessons that I'd learned about movement building and organizing in South Africa in the U.S., which is a very different politics than what I embodied in the 1970s. So I guess we can we can start there because you do talk a lot about the racial biases in some of these programs. Um, there is a sense 
sometimes that uh, from people that that the um electronic monitoring home uh surveillance being outside of the prison that that's got to be applied basically equally to people when that's not of course the case well i think that's true i mean one of the remarkable things about electronic monitoring is the fact that we have almost no data on it uh we have we do have numbers for people in prison. We can get racial breakdowns of who's in prison. But I mean, I've sent out a whole lot of Freedom of Information Act requests to states, to counties, and so forth, trying to get them to provide simple data about electronic monitoring. How many people do you have on it? What's a racial breakdown of it? How much are they paying on it if they are paying? And most importantly, how many people are being sent back to jail or to prison for minor violations, coming home late from work because the bus is delayed, having to take a child to the hospital without permission and so forth. So we don't really have data to even know what the racial bias within electronic monitoring is. The few places we do have, I mean, they're, they're as shocking as the, the racial data on mass incarceration. In Chicago, 70% of the people on electronic monitoring pretrial are black. In a in a in a county that's 25% black in Los Angeles, 70% of the people on electronic monitoring are black. In a in a jurisdiction that's 8% black, so there's disproportionate usage of electronic monitoring, which mirrors what happens in the mass incarceration system as a whole in prisons and jails and immigration prisons. And and we can expand on that a little bit, but I, it might be helpful to if I could ask you to define um, the term surveillance capitalism, which is a through line in your book. Um, and and how did the rise of surveillance capitalism coincide with the rise of global neoliberalism? Well, I mean, surveillance capitalism as an as an entity really means that our, that data becomes the new sort of the new raw material for making money. So all these all these technologies, many of which I detail in as e-carceration, whether it's license plate readers, street cameras, facial recognition, electronic monitoring being kind of the classic because it's a, a clear, it's clearly a process of incarceration that's more like a prison or a jail than say facial recognition which isn't which people don't necessarily associate with depriving people of their liberty but all of this is used as a way for for companies to gather data on us to try to predict our behavior and then to use those predictions either to control us if we are what i call the criminalized sector of the working class, that is poor people who are already marginalized, who are maybe been in the criminal legal system, been in the mental health system, been in substance abuse uh, programs and so forth. All of these people are already being being watched and being controlled and being blocked from access to, oppor to opportunity. But then we have the, the, you know, the broad surveillance of cell phone calls, emails and so forth, all of which gather more and more data which go to the cloud, which is owned by Amazon, Google, et cetera. And we don't know what happens to it, but I think we can guess when we get all these messages popping in onto our screens about buy this, buy that. And they're talking about something we just sent an email about two minutes ago. Yeah, well, which makes your uh, comment about how you have sent FOIA requests and tried to get some transparency on this issue, especially ironic because the breadth and the wealth of data in this area has got to be infinite. Absolutely, but what happens is that the companies that sign the contracts for electronic monitoring aren't held to any accountability at all. So I've also sent a, around Freedom of Information Act requests to many jurisdictions asking them to give me reports, evaluations, assessments of the impact of their of their so-called programs and I I think I've managed to get about two reports that were generated by a jurisdiction or by a company. It's not part of their contract. The only thing that's stipulated in the contract, how much you're going to pay for the devices and what's the what are the kind of technical specs of these devices. But there's nothing about accountability. What are the rules going to be for the people who are on it? 
And how are we going to see if it's having an impact? Because, uh, I mean, I call this in the book, I refer to this as the mythology of electronic monitoring. We assume it's doing something because people say this is what it's supposed to do. But there's no there's no data, there's no proof, as you as you point out, in this era where you know data re, data rules, but all of a sudden we have this surveillance technology that's gathering all this data and we can't even access it to know what it's saying about us or how it's being used against us unless we go to apply to you know rent an apartment or apply for credit and all of a sudden you know we get these numbers and these rejections back without explanation um, so it's it, it's really a, a a cloud of mystery a, a cloud of mystery there you go very uh, unintentional pun uh, <laughs> potentially <laughs>